go away. I, I still don't play this game anymore. Honestly, I. He seems to be enjoying himself. It's not much of a statement to say that gaming has been on a slight downward trend these past 10 years or so, with beloved AAA franchises developed by highly thought of companies now seemingly putting out more mediocre and poor games now than ever before. And while some companies are able to put out a really good game every now and again, it seems like gamers have lost their faith in companies putting out something that isn't, at best, pure mediocrity. Nowadays, gamers seem to be more content with sticking with older titles rather than playing newer ones. For its more simplistic yet fun and addicting gameplay, its above and beyond soundtrack, its sheer amount of content packed in at once with no type of paid DLC, or its interesting art style? Eh, who knows. At the same time gamers were going back to play older titles, they were also moving towards newer, more simplistic titles made by a single person. By the early 2000s, with the internet becoming a regular thing in common households, and game engines becoming more accessible to the average person, ambitious developers began creating their own games and distributing them online. These became known as independent video games, or simply, indie games. Games are created by small teams of developers, or more commonly, a single developer, usually without the backing of a large publisher. While they've existed since the early 1970s, they didn't start to gain mainstream attention until the mid to late 2000s, with the release of games such as Cave Story, Gary's Mod, and Plants vs Zombies. The early to mid 2010s saw the release of even more notable indie games such as Super Meat Boy, The Binding of Isaac, Minecraft, Terraria, Fez, Undertale, and a bunch more. In fact, in 2015, at a time where indie games were very popular, the indie game scene feared that there would be an indie apocalypse due to the sheer amount of indie games being published on marketplaces such as Steam. And while this indie apocalypse never occurred, there have still been worries that developers aren't being discovered due to the sheer size of the market. Meanwhile, in March of 2018, an individual based in Canada by the name of Jeffrey McPig Lonstool, at the time going by the alias Pizza Tower Guy, you see where I'm going with this, begins work on a spiritual successor to the Wario Land series of games developed by Nintendo, under the working title The Leaning Tower of Pizza, and begins to post concept art and gameplay on his Tumblr page, Wieners Don't Do Drugs, a page previously used to showcase his progress on his game of the same name. Eventually, he'd rename the game to what would become more widely known as Pizza Tower. Over the next four and a half years, he'd work on the game and recruit the help of Mr. Sauceman, Klaus Gigito, and Post Elvis as composers, alongside Surtif as a programmer. He'd also release demo builds to patrons and post work in progress footage of the game on his YouTube channel. McPig would even stream himself working on the game on his Switch channel. Originally planned to be released sometime in the third quarter of 2022, the game was delayed until early 2023 in order to add more polish to the overall game. Eventually, on December 2nd, 2022, a Steam page for the game was put up with a trailer and a release date, January 26th, 2023. On that day, after years of development, the full game was released to the public, and... Yeah, I think people like it. Pizza Tower is a 2D platformer developed by indie developers Toy the Pizza, a duo consisting of programmers McPig and Sertif, and serves as a spiritual successor to the Wario Land series, a series of six games developed by Nintendo, with the last installment coming in 2008 with Wario Land Shake It on the Wii. Pizza Tower mainly takes inspiration from the fifth main installment in the series, Wario Land 4 on the Game Boy Advance, released back in 2001. Though McPig, the game's main developer, has stated that he took heavy inspiration from each Wario Land game. The game centers around a pizza chef and his failing pizzeria, this guy, Peppino. One day, while waiting around for customers, the game's main antagonist, Pizza Face, shows up to tell Peppino about his plan to blow up his pizzeria with a laser beam at the top of the pizza tower. Peppino, not wanting to lose his workplace and job to a plan conducted by Dr. Doofenshmirtz, sets out on a journey to climb the pizza tower and stop Pizza Face from blowing up the pizzeria. 
While Pizza Tower has been in development since 2018, McPig has been creating games since at least November of 2017. Posting development clips on his Tumblr page, Wieners Don't Do Drugs. McPig landed on the idea of a 2D RPG game with survival horror elements, where Pepino would fight pizza monsters in his restaurant similar in vain to games like Resident Evil. After some time using RPG Maker, he made the jump to Game Maker, and began development on the game titled Weenie Cop in order to get a feel for Game Maker. Game Maker is the engine used to create highly regarded games such as Undertale, Deltarune, Rivals of Aether, Hotline Miami, and AM2R. He eventually dropped Weenie Cop and conceived the idea for Pizza Tower, initially titled The Leaning Tower of Pizza, using the Waterland games as a base. McPig would then post early development footage on the Wieners Don't Do Drugs Tumblr page, and create a Discord server where development updates would be posted. Over time, McPig would recruit Mr. Sauceman and Class G2 as composers for the game, add more levels, post demo builds for the public and for patrons to play and test, etc. By 2020, Sartif, a patron of the game, was added to the official development team due to his help with work in progress builds of the game, and slowly but surely, development of the game would progress through 2020, 2021, and 2022. By June of 2022, the last patron build of the game titled The Eggplant Build would be released, showcasing the game's levels and mechanics in a close to finished state. Originally aiming for a mid to late 2022 release date, the game would miss its intended release date due to McPig wanting to clean up and properly finish the levels within the game. After some more time and after more test builds were released to a small group of people, the Steam page for Pizza Tower was put up alongside a release date of January 26, 2023. The game was released, and well, it was aight. The game has received overwhelmingly positive reviews over its fun and engaging gameplay, its over-the-top visual style inspired by cartoons such as Spongebob and Franco-Belgian comics, making use of high-res pixel art, a style uncommonly used within the gaming industry, and having a high-energy 16-bit Sega Genesis-styled soundtrack. The game has retained a loyal and active community, with fan games based on Pizza Tower being developed as recently as 2022. After beating the game once, then going for 100% on the same save file, and clocking in over 60 hours, I figured it'd be cool to put all my thoughts on the game into a single video. And also because I got nothing else better to do. After selecting a blank save file, the player is presented with a short cutscene with Pepino, looking towards the tower over a cliff. Oh, and this guy? That's Gustavo. He'll be important later. Walking into the tower's entrance, you're greeted with a single level doorway, with the pathway to the next room blocked off by some pizza blocks. With no other choice... Oh... Uh, let's uh... Let's try that again. With no other choice, you walk into the doorway. This is the tutorial level. This level teaches the player the basic controls and moveset of Pepino, such as mock running, body slamming, wall running, grabbing, rolling, super jumping, as well as some other gameplay mechanics such as metal crates that can only be broken by running at a high enough speed, or body slamming from a high enough height, and grabbing enemies to throw them at targets. If you've used the internet in the last 5 to 8 years, first off, may God bless your poor, poor soul. And second, you're probably thinking to yourself that the music in the background sounds quite familiar. And that's because the song makes use of the Neapolitan song, That. A song which was sampled almost two decades prior to this game's release in the video game Spider-Man 2, played during pizza delivery missions. In fact, in earlier builds of the game, the song's use was much more apparent. You're probably wondering what that thing is. That is Pizza Granny. She guides the player through the tutorial, telling them about Pepino's moveset. You're also probably wondering what these things are. These are Toppins. These guys serve as the main collectibles throughout the game and are very important, with five of these little guys being spread out throughout each level, each representing a different pizza topping. Mushroom, cheese, tomato, sausage, and pineapple. Ah. Uh, you know what? This isn't really my problem. Uh, I'm, I'm out of here. Now that the pizza blocks are gone, you can move on to the next room and enter into the first level, John Gutter. John Gutter serves as the entrance level, allowing the player to utilize the moves taught in the tutorial and shows the basic mechanics of the game in an actual setting. The player is also introduced to some new mechanics, such as the points and ranking system. 
Points can be accumulated by collecting pizza points, killing enemies, destroying pizza blocks, and way more that you'll find out soon enough. After killing an enemy, you also start a combo. Combos are a cornerstone aspect of the game, encouraging skillful player from the player in order to retain that combo, and these serves as another way of gaining points. To increase your combo, you simply kill more enemies. This also refills the combo timer. Retaining this timer can be done by collecting pizza points or collecting certain collectibles. Getting hit decreases the timer by 2.5 seconds, and the combo ends after 6.7 seconds total. As your reward, you get rewarded with pizza points based on how big the combo was. Personally, I really like the combo system. It encourages players to learn the layout of the level, and come up with ways on how to retain that combo in repeat runs of the level. Am I supposed to be here? This is a secret room. They can be entered by touching a secret eye. There are three secret eyes hidden throughout each level. Some are out in the open, while some are hidden in plain sight. Each secret eye takes a player to a set secret room. These rooms often center around an aspect found within the level. Since this is the first level, these center around basic movement. Within each room contains a pizza sauna, a character that depicts one of the three members of the dev team, or a patron who donated $20 or more to Pizza Tower's Patreon during the first half of 2019. Touching a pizza sauna gives the player 150 points and tells the player thank you. By touching the secret eye within the room, you'll be taken out of the room back to the normal level, and the secret eye will disappear, meaning each secret room can only be entered once per run. Originally, there were supposed to be 6 secret rooms per level, but were eventually cut down to 3. These 6 secret rooms can still be seen in some pre-release builds of the game. Who the hell is this guy? That's Jerome. He's a janitor. Sometimes he's sleeping, sometimes he's eating, and sometimes he's working. He can be found hidden in every level, and after walking up to him, he will join the player and follow them, similar to how Toffins follow the player after they collect them. Also hidden in every level is a janitor room, where the level's tower's secret treasure can be found, and these rooms can't be accessed without Jerome. By taking him to the locked door, he will unlock the door, allowing the player to collect the tower's secret treasure. The secret treasure gives the player 3000 points and refills the player's combo timer if they had a combo running. In the early stages of development, the Tower Secret Treasure went through a few iterations in terms of what use it served. In the earliest publicly playable build of the game, it was the main collectible needed to finish the level. Later on, it was changed to a secondary collectible, acquired by feeding Pillage on all five Toffins found throughout each level. That's fucking grim. It was then changed to a collectible that you can find in the level without Jerome, until it was changed so that Jerome was required to collect the Tower Secret Treasure. Uh oh. This is Pizza Time, the main feature of this game. Pizza Time acts similar to the Frog Switch mechanic from Wario Land 4, where by activating it, you begin a timer that counts down until you've reached the exit door of the level. The timer length is not universal, and varies from level to level. I've also neglected to mention a certain type of block until now. These are John blocks. These can be seen throughout the level as transparent or solid blocks. During pizza time, the states of these blocks are reversed, allowing for previously inaccessible areas to be accessed, similar to how Kairu blocks work in Wario Land 4. Also during pizza time, 5 points are deducted from the player's score every second, and John faces appear and spit down enemies to try and slow the player down. This encourages the player to quickly make their way back to the entrance of the level to avoid a bad score. Should the player not make it to the entrance before time expires, the level will not immediately end, rather Pizza Face, the main antagonist, will wake up and chase their player down as punishment for being a slow ass fat ass bitch. Getting touched by him will cause a time over, making the player replay the level from the beginning. However, should the player make it back in time and go through the doorway, you get the idea. Ranks are based on the score accumulated from playing the level, and each level has a different rank requirement. There are 6 different ranks that can be obtained within the level. These are D, C, B, A, S, and... I'll cover P ranks later in the video, but for now you just need to worry about these 5. You will have noticed that you gain $10 for every new topping collected, I'll talk about that in a bit. You may have also noticed that Pizza Tower doesn't ask what difficulty you want to play the game on before starting a new save file. 
That's because Pizza Tower instead lets the player decide the difficulty themselves in the level by deciding on what rank to go for. I find this idea of letting the player choose their own difficulty for each level at theoretically any time an interesting concept that I haven't seen implemented in a platformer. The last time I saw a remotely similar mechanic used was in Persona 4, where while the game does ask you what difficulty you want to play the game on before starting a new save file, you could change the difficulty of the game mid-save, and even change other attributes such as how much XP and money you earn from fights, allowing the player to adjust settings to their liking to make for a more comfortable playing experience. After leaving the level, and by going right, you're taken to the rest of the hub world of Flora 1 that contains the other three levels. Pizza Escape, Ancient Cheese, and Blood Sauce Dungeon. The game is split up into five different floors, each floor having four levels and one boss fight, with each floor having its own unique theme, which is also reflected within the levels. Floor 1 has a medieval slash castle theme, Floor 2 has a wild western theme, Floor 3 has an island resort theme going on, Floor 4 is more of an industrial theme floor, and Floor 5 is more horror centric. Each floor also has a different remix of the Floor 1 song, made to match the theme of the floor. Each floor also contains some extra things, such as a computer that tracks stats throughout your adventure, a pizza granny sign that tracks the completion of each level within a floor, a closet where you can swap your clothes, and a chef task room which tracks the achievements achieved within a floor. Oh yeah, chef tasks. Chef tasks act as the achievements of this game and are required for 100% completion. There are 72 total chef tasks, and they can range from simple, self-explanatory tasks to strange and vague. After collecting each chef task on a given floor, the color of the entryway will turn from white to gold. So that's cool, I guess. Oh hey! On every floor, Pizza Granny will randomly spawn in one of four locations when a player enters the floor. She works similarly to how she does in the tutorial, in which a dialogue box will show up after approaching her. In the hub world, however, instead of guiding the player through Pepino's moveset, he will instead give the player gameplay tips or say something random. One last thing I want to mention in relation to points is that after completing a level, you unlock what's called a pizza portal for that level. Alternatively, if you complete the tutorial in less than a minute and 45 seconds, you will unlock pizza portals for every level, regardless of completion. Pizza portals are found near the entrance of the level and can only be accessed during pizza time. After entering into one of these things, you'll be taken back to the Pillar John room and are tasked with getting back to the level entrance again. The catch is, is that whatever time you had remaining, is the time you are given to get back to the start. Your reward for this, however, is 3000 points, and a cool new song to go along with it. This is another one of those mechanics that favor the speed and skill of the player, and it's a feature I wholeheartedly enjoy. Plus, it can create for some really chaotic and exciting moments every now and again. Oh yeah, the game. Chronologically, the next level is Pizza Escape. Why chronologically, you ask? That's because in this game, you can play any level on a floor in any order. Remember when I started by going into John Gutter? If I really wanted to, I could have saved John Gutter for later and gone straight into Pizza Escape instead. This is one aspect of the game I really like, as it allows for each playthrough of the game to be different and keeps things open-ended by letting the player choose themselves what stage to play next. Pizza Escape contains the first of many level mechanics, or gimmicks. Each level has a unique aspect within it, whether it be a transformation for Pepino, or an asset within the level that Pepino can interact with. For this level, we have the Knight Transformation. In this day, after pulling the sword from the stone King Arthur style, and then getting struck by lightning, Pepino dons a suit of armor, causing him to kill any enemy if he jumps onto them and gains the ability to double jump. He can also ground pound enemies by pressing down while in the air, and can move at quick speeds if he touches any slope. While moving fast, he also gains the ability to kill these rats that are usually there to block the path of Pepino while he's in his regular state. To go back into Pepino's regular state, simply walk up to one of these guys, he says a little prayer, and boom! Checkmate Reddit. We also get introduced to Keys, this new enemy that can kick you into a little ball. There's only so much in the level I can talk about without it becoming somewhat stale, so I'll quickly summarize what I think of this level. Great as another opening stage that sets the standard for levels coming up and is overall fun to play. Now, if you're an expert like me, you probably collected a total of 10 toppings by now, meaning you have enough to rent out a boss cave from this guy, Mr. Stick. These contain, you guessed it, 
the bosses for each floor, which are required to be in order to progress to the next floor. Boss gate rents will start out at $100 on floor 1, but rise in value after each floor, forcing the player to explore each level for toppings in order to progress further. Which makes sense. Does that mean there's economic inflation in this game? Now we could talk about the boss fight right now, but let's quickly go through the other two levels. Ancient Cheese is an ancient Greek inspired level, who would have thought, that introduces these pizza goblins that throw bombs that Pepino can then pick up and throw back. You may have noticed already, but most of the enemies in this game are pizza themed, and the enemies that aren't themed around pizza are themed around the lore of the game. Some of these designs I find dope, a little goofy and... Oh Jesus, what the fuck? A good level which I like quite a bit, but nothing too overly remarkable to say about it. Blood Sauce Dungeon is a dungeon themed level that makes heavy use of verticality with the player descending down the dungeon and is the only level to not use horizontal room transitions, for the most part. There's also this lava that throws you up into the air 3D Mario style, and these flying sardines that are about as effective as a Twitter argument. The level is cool, but not really one of my favorites, and uh, overall I found it pretty unremarkable. The silhouette effect they got going on here is pretty cool though. Now that those two stages are done, we can finally go over As mentioned before, each floor contains a boss gate that must be rented from Mr. Stick for a fixed amount. After renting the gate, you can go ahead and fight the boss. Each boss in the game, aside from the last one, has an interesting history behind their inclusion. Pepperman had been in the game since Demo 1, and fought much differently, being fought within the level and having three phases within the fight. He was even supposed to be a playable character in Refrigerator Refrigerator Freezerator before he was made a boss again. The next three bosses were also meant to be playable characters, but were eventually made boss fights instead. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. I'll speak a bit more about each fight when I get to them, but for now, Pepperman. Pepperman is, well, a Pepperman who is a hypocritical contrarian artist. And yes, this is apparently a real aspect of the character said by McPick himself. He can be seen painting this thing before noticing Pepino and preparing to engage in battle. The fight is fairly straightforward, using moves that are similar to those used by Wario in Wario Land 4. After hitting him a certain amount of times, these things that look straight out of an NES game start appearing, shit starts falling from the sky, and these statues appear that must be broken in order to get the opening to hit Pepperman. After whittling him down, Pepino gets the final blow and PSYCH! We get the run back now. You now have to fight Pepperman all over again, only now, he's much faster, and some attributes of the fight have been changed to make the fight harder. Beating him the second time, Pepperman shrinks down to a fraction of his size, where you now have to hit him once again in order to end the fight. You know, what if I just kind of left him there, and you know, just- a Oh shit! Killing him in a smaller form ends the fight and gives us a key, personally crafted by DJ Khaled. Major key alert. With the key in hand, we can finally unlock the elevator and proceed to the next floor. But before I head up, I suppose I should talk about my thoughts on the game so far. Visually, this game is great. It takes a visual style that has been done to death in the indie game scene and gives it its own unique spin. The game is very quirky and wacky, in the same vein as pre 2010 Snicktoon shows such as Ren and Stimpy, Spongebob, and Rocko's Bar in Life and this is further reflected in the game's animation, where the animation helps to bring more life into the game. Take Pepino for example. Motherfucker doesn't speak a single word in the entire game, yet the animation helps bring so much personality and life into it. The visuals also serve as indicators within gameplay, highlighting what you can and can't interact with. Gameplay wise, this is one of the best games I've ever played. The movement in this game, god I love it so much. The toolkit they gave Pepino somehow meshes together so incredibly well, and controlling him, especially on a controller, feels amazing. The closest game I can compare the feeling after pulling off some cool movement to is Melee, where the movement at first grasp takes some time to learn and getting used to, but pulling it off precisely how you want it to feels so satisfying. With that being said, I'd compare the movement and overall speed to a 2D Sonic game. In my opinion, if you're gonna play this game, play it on a controller using the analog stick, or play on a keyboard, 
or this thing or this. Really, whatever one makes you feel comfortable, I don't care. Now that I have that established, let's move on, shall we? While I did briefly touch on Pepino's moveset, I wanted to wait until now to go into the nuance regarding it. Pepino's main move, Mock Dash, has three main states or Mock Stages. Mock Stage 1 has him running at a slightly fast pace, fast enough to stun enemies but not fast enough to scare them. Mock Stage 2 has Pepino running faster, indicated by the sound wave in front of him. In this state, he can now break metal boxes, scare enemies in front of him, and can even perform a super jump by pressing up on the control pad. The last stage, Mach Stage 3, has him running even faster. This state can only be achieved by holding your desired horizontal direction alongside the dash key for a few seconds, and maintaining this state throughout a level requires memorization of the level layout and quick reaction times. While running, you can also perform a few other moves. You can dive by holding down in midair, you can perform a moving body slam or dive drop by pressing jump while diving, you can roll by holding down on the ground, and you can super jump by pressing up while running on the ground at Mach 2 or 3, which can also be cancelled into a Mach 2 run. Earlier builds of the game had Pepino running a bit faster and getting to Mach 3 earlier. The speed here was way too quick in my opinion, and I'm glad they toned it down in the final release of the game. The grab is probably my favorite move in the game. It might seem like a weird choice, but you'll see why in a low second. Grabs are supposed to be used for grabbing enemies to then throw them up, forward, or down, or to use as a slight momentum starter from standing still. Instead, I like to use my grabs like this. After initiating a grab, by pressing and holding down, you can initiate a belly slide. Belly slides are amazing for quickly getting momentum from a standstill, as they propel you much further than a normal grab and allow you to get into Mach 2 Dash after it ends. And this... This doesn't actually have an official name yet, so I'm gonna call it Grab Cancelling. Grab Cancelling can be done by pressing the opposite direction any time during the grab animation. This will stop all momentum and turn you around. This, combined with the belly slide, dive, and dive drop, can make some of the cleanest movement I've personally seen in a platformer. Like, just look at this, man. Seriously, if you're gonna play this game, learn how to control Pepino properly. I guarantee it'll pay off. Before moving on, there's two more moves I'd like to mention. By holding up and pressing grab either on the ground or in the air, you can perform an uppercut move. This move can be used as a pseudo double jump, or simply on the ground. However, regardless of if you decide to use this move in the air or not, you'll be locked out of performing any other one of Pepino's moves until you touch the ground. This move is good for reaching that area just barely out of reach, or simply, to beat some enemies with. And that... that's a parry. By pressing the taunt button before being hit by an enemy or projectile, Pepino will parry the attack. This will result in the enemy being killed, or the projectile being reflected back depending on the circumstance. At first, I thought the parry was a bit useless, only ever finding myself using it in rare circumstances. But honestly, I've grown to like its inclusion in the game. The fact that you could theoretically go through the entire game without getting hit using knowledge of enemy attacks alone and a bit of pure reaction time is a really nice concept. And also because you're kind of required to use it for 100% in the game, but shh. Now, there's one more aspect that I haven't touched upon that I'm sure you're dying to hear me talk about. The clothes. The clothes are a cool addition that helps to add a small but nice amount of customization into the game. Clothes can be unlocked by meeting certain conditions. Some are easy as taunting 50 times, and some can be as hard as no hitting every boss, and as strange as holding down in certain spots in a specific level. But enough about the clothes, there's still more game to be played, so up we go. Floor 2, or Western District, as it's referred to in-game, takes on an old Western-slash-Wild West theme, and in my opinion is where the game really begins to find its footing. 
While I had enjoyed what I've been playing so far, before Floor 2, I had previously played every level in Floor 1 in the Sage 2019 demo of the game, so I had a mild idea of what I was getting into. Everything past Floor 1 though was completely new, meaning I had to rely on my small brain knowledge of the game at that point and was essentially playing blind. The first level on this floor is Oregano Desert, a simple desert level with totem poles, low shops with sausage guys as clerks, and... Okay, I'll talk about the music. I'll get quick and straight to the point with this. The music in this game is beyond incredible and is genuinely one of the best video game soundtracks I've heard in a long time. Every song in this game perfectly encapsulates the level theme and helps to bring more life into this game's already full of life visuals. The work Mr. Sauceman and Klasky Diesel put into these songs is absolutely incredible and they certainly did not disappoint when it came to the game's music. The full soundtrack can be found on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Steam, and Bandcamp, as well as each song plus a few that never made it into the final game being found on both artists' SoundClouds. I heavily encourage you to at least listen to a few songs outside of the game, just to be able to focus on the music exclusively and really feel the work put into each song. I'll have more to say about each song when I get to it, but here are some of my favorites in no particular order. Back on topic, Oriano Desert is noticeably a lot longer than previous levels, which at first I didn't really like but after replaying the level a few times, I grew to appreciate the longer levels as A, you get to play more of the game, which who doesn't love that, and B, encourages more exploration of each area. That being said, Oregano Desert also includes one of the things I really don't like about this game, checkpoints. In a game where a traditional health system and lives aren't present here and where falling off the screen already respawns you at the start of the room with no real punishment, I find checkpoints to be one of those few redundant features of the game. Pizza Tower isn't really that difficult at its core. Falling off the level at worst gives you less time to recover your combo, and even then your combo timer is frozen during the recovery state. I'm fine with this game not having a health or life system, but there needs to be difficulty in order to counteract those exclusions, though you could argue that the ranking system solves this issue. I can somewhat understand checkpoints being in secret rooms where falling off would be common in order to reduce player frustration, but for the main parts of the level, I can't really think of a good reason other than to make the game slightly more accessible. Next up is Waste Yard, a level where we see Peppino die. Ah! Jokes aside, Waste Yard features the ghost transformation where we see Peppino turn into a ghost, becoming invincible at the cost of, you know, being alive. You start off slow, but can increase the speed by consuming ghost peppers. There's also these corpses that, when touched, allow Peppino to surf on them. Oh. Nightmare Fuel. Waste Yard is a nice level, but I think it could have been cooler. In the eggplant build of the game, Waste Yard uses a placeholder song called The Phantom Tower in place of Tombstone Arizona. And if you ask me, I prefer this unused song over the one that goes used in the final game. Take a little listen. The level also played much differently in the underground part, but uh, who cares. Overall though, not much to say about this level personally. Still a good one. Fun Farm features special guest Mort the Chicken, and you're probably wondering what the hell a Mort the Chicken is. Well, Mort the Chicken is a 3D platformer for the PS1, released back in late 2000, that sees Mort rescuing a bunch of baby chicks because some cube guy from an alternate universe of cubes forgot to put his glasses on and thought the hay bells were his own kidnapped citizens. A bunch of baby ducks, send them to the moon. The game was met with words from critics and soon faded into relative obscurity. Now how is he allowed to be included in this game? Well, McPig asked the creator of Mort the Chicken, Ed Anunziata, for permission to use him in the game. <coughs> so, 
what does Mort do in game? After touching one of these walls, which is a nice reference to the PS1 game, Mort jumps out of said well. Touching him attaches Mort to Pepino's head, giving Pepino the ability to double jump, hook onto Mort hooks, which give him his double jump back, and attack in three different directions. I like the music in this level. The song in the first part of this level is a soothing and calming melody that, while being totally out of place in a game that features songs like fits in a weird way, which I really like. That being said, there isn't really much I have to say about this level. Oh, and, uh, this. So that's nice, I guess. The last level in Western District, and my personal favorite level on this floor, is Fast Food Saloon, and has all the makings of a good pizza tower level. I love a layout that encourages fast gameplay, which is reflected in how you require the toppings and how the level's main gimmick works. A not be an energetic banger of a song that samples a vocal track from Data File 2 by Zero G, which is the same sample used in Sneak Man by Hideki Naganuma, and secret eye locations that make you think to double check certain locations. If you couldn't already guess, I really like this level, not only because of the reasons I laid out 10 seconds ago, but also because it sets the player up for what to expect going into 4 3. I view the first two floors as a tutorial floor and a proving grounds floor. Fast Food Salon perfectly lays out to the player what they should start getting used to going forward in the game. It's pure fun encapsulated into a single level. You can also do this, which while completely unintentional by the developers, adds a little bit of flair to the way the level plays. Are you a casual gamer who plays the level as intended and takes the normal route? Or are you that confident in your skills who decides to take the faster yet harder route? The strat is also used in individual level speed runs, so um, that's cool. With all that out of the way, we arrive at the second boss of the game, the Vigilante. The Vigilante is a cheese slime cowboy that was tricked by Pizza Face into thinking that Pepino is a wanted criminal, leading to a pistol duel with him. Yeah, not that much going on lore-wise. The Vigilante boss fight is my favorite boss fight in the entire game, and for three reasons. The first being the way the fight is played. Every boss in this game has you using your regular moveset to deal damage to the boss. The Vigilante fight differs from all these fights by giving you access to a gun and has the both of you duking it out Mega Man style. Similar to Mega Man, Pepino has access to two kinds of shots. A normal shot that does 1 out of 8 damage needed to take away 1 HP from Vigilante, and a charge shot that does 6 out of 8 damage. While the charge shot does more damage, its charge can't be held, as the charge shot will immediately be fired once the chamber is filled with bullets, requiring the player to think about when to charge their shot, adding to that small layer of depth. Or, you know, they could just spam the shoot button. Vigilante's attacks are also really cool. These can range from the Scorpion from Black Ops 1, a rocket launcher, and most horrifying of all, Flog. The second reason is because of the design of the fight. The fight is set on a stage meant for a play, with cardboard cutouts of clouds and other cowboys. I like this design. It gives me this Paper Mario Thousand Year Door kind of feel to it, while also still managing to be its own unique thing. I also like how in the second phase, the lights dim and all you can make out are silhouettes of everything that's going on, tying in gameplay with the design, which is a really neat touch. The third reason is because, well, I'll let you listen for yourself. This song is such a huge reason on why this is my favorite fight. No other fight in the game, except for maybe the first and last fight, captured the pure intensity of the setting. Hearing this song truly made me realize that this soundtrack was something else, and is easily one of my top 3 songs from the soundtrack. The electric guitar that blares in the background, that little synth thing, I don't know what you call it, they all just mesh together in a way that makes it this hype-ass song straight out of the early 2000s. After dealing the final blow to Vigilante, you both prepare to engage in a good old pistol duel. Anxiously, waiting for the signal to... I should let you know that that timing is very forgiving, so no you aren't a god gamer, you are trash. You 
Floor 3, in my personal opinion, is where the game really starts to shine through and gives out some of the best this game has to offer in every aspect. Two levels on this floor are in my top 10 levels for this game as I find them both brilliantly made in one way or another and both offer something unique in some way. I'll show you what I mean with my favorite level on this floor, Cross Cove. Cross Cove is incredible and is in my top 3 for personal favorite pizza tower levels. To start, the visual style in here is pretty interesting opting to make use of pink sand in the outside area instead of regular sand used in every game with a tropical area ever, which is a decision I can get behind and really adds to that uniqueness factor that makes Pizza Tower stand out. The inner cove areas are also a really nice addition to the level and adds a bit more flavor to it. The way this level plays is the main reason I really like this level. There are a few Pizza Tower levels that I will replay over and over and over again just to learn the layout front to back and perfect the movement within the level, and Crust Cove just happens to be one of those levels that I come back to whenever I load up the game. Hell, I even went as far as to speedrun the level for a good leaderboard time. I still haven't gotten that time yet because I'm a massive thrower, but I still enjoyed the grind nonetheless. And while I did mention it earlier in the video, I can't help but mention the music in this level again. You know what? Take a look, take another listen, because why not? Awesome, I know, right? Usually games with tropic slash beach themed levels include a sort of chilled out theme that makes use of instruments such as steel drums, bongos, claves, and are in the 90 to 105 BPM range. Of course, there can be some variation depending on the game, but what I listed is typically the norm. However, Pizza Tower takes a cool, I'm sorry, angle on this type of music. This mesh of tropical Caribbean music as well as this game's high octane musical style combines with this fun take on beach slash tropical music in video games. In short, Cross Cove, good level. Gold star for you. Yeah, enough of that, moving on. Deep Dish 9 is a level I don't really have a lot of words for. Not because I hate it in any way, but because to me, it's just kinda there. The only parts I did like enough to remember to put into the script was the music and the concept of going to other planets within the level, which is me. Since I gotta talk about something, I'll give you some trivia about this level, or more specifically, the song. So this song originally wasn't meant for this level. As fitting as the song is for this level, it was instead meant for a scrapped level called Space Pinball. This stage plays heavy emphasis on the ball transformation on Goblin Bots, and also made use of this unused object called the Super Side Spring, that would bounce you off in the opposite direction you hit it in. The level, to me at least, felt long-winded and at times a little frustrating. While I couldn't find a reason why this level was scrapped, I personally think the long-windedness of the level is the reason why. That being said, not all the assets of this level went to waste. The song and first instance of teleporter pieces were reused for Deep Dish 9, the first instance of UF Olives were reused for Oregano Desert, the time gates were reused for Fast Food Salon, the backgrounds used in the level were reused for the first three floors of the chef task rooms, and the first use of Goblin Vault was reused for Golf. Speaking of... This level's good. Like, really good. Like, top 5 levels good. I could talk all day, well, maybe not all day, more like 3 or 5 minutes I suppose, about how much I like this level. The level presents itself with this cheery, upbeat attitude, which is reflected by the song in the level, Goody. The song in this level is just so fun and jolly, especially with those little vocals of someone eating food and the sounds of microwaves thrown in. It kind of feels like something that belongs in Rice Star or another game of that caliber. The design also matches with the song, presenting you with this colorful, vibrant, golf-themed restaurant where the owner happens to be a golf ball that he used to hit into basketball hoops since he couldn't afford actual golf holes, despite the fact that the backgrounds have golf holes. Stuff like this is so stupid and I love it. Speaking of the backgrounds, the backgrounds are also really cool. A lot of detail clearly went into making the backgrounds present in the level, with a few neat in-game references being made within those backgrounds, which is a somewhat common occurrence throughout the game, which I'll point out whenever the opportunity arises. Oh, and about the gameplay? If you think it's bad, 
let me tell you, it could have been a whole lot worse. And in fact, let me let me just show you instead. Okay, granted, this was an April Fool's joke intentionally made to be complete as and was not reflective of the final game in any shape, but in an alternate timeline, you could have done this instead. The level sees you use this guy named Greaseball as a golf ball in order to advance forward in the level and serves as the level's main gimmick. He starts off stationary, but can be moved by running into him and hitting him, or by using your golf club which allows you to have more control over where Greaseball goes. After the first two rooms, the level becomes a lot more open-ended, as you're presented with four golf courses, with three of them being completely optional, though those ones contain toppings necessary to continue on with the game and the secret eyes, and Jerome. So while you could skip them and leave the level early, I'd advise against it. The golf ball mechanics are really well done here, and the courses present throughout the level complement the mechanics really well. At first I found them a little annoying, but over time I grew to enjoy them, and now I use them anywhere I can. Probably because I stopped using the analog stick for the golf club. I know I suggested using an analog stick to play this game, but for whatever reason, using the analog stick makes the club a lot less responsive. So for this level, I recommend using a D-pad instead. All in all, I find this one to be one of the best levels in Pizza Tower. Not only for its design and music, but for its gimmicky, yet fun gameplay. Another cool star. You see Brick's party blower in his mouth? Yeah, that party blower isn't colored in and is actually transparent. Good luck sleeping tomorrow with that on your mind. Despite that stupid little bit I just did a few minutes ago, I got nothing against this level and I actually found it to be a lot of fun, mostly due to the introduction of our secondary playable character, Gustavo. I hinted at Gustavo being more than just a supporting cast member at the start of this video, but never said anything beyond that. Well, over your journey, Gustavo has been developing a friendship with a stupid rat named Brick. At first they were seen fighting and screwing around, but over time they began to develop a mutual friendship with each other, and by floor 3, they had developed their friendship to the point where they could work together and assist Peppino on his journey. We get to see the manifestation of this in Gnome Forest, where at a certain point, Peppino decides to take a quick power nap, and let our two unlikely matches take over for a bit where we see them deliver gnome pizzas to these little gnomes. Apart from Gustavo and Brick, the level's main gimmick is to deliver these pizzas within the time limit in order to obtain toppings, similar in vain to Fast Food Saloon. Gustavo and Brick play very differently from Peppino. At first, I felt like they played similar to Mario and Yoshi in the 2D games, but as I played them more, it feels more of a mix of Mario and Yoshi and the ring power mechanic from Knuckles Chaotix, due to their movement revolving around them splitting up from each other and eventually rejoining. While well, Gustavo, who I'm just going to call Gus moving forward for brevity reasons, and Brick still retain the basic moveset of dashing, jumping, and taunting, their other moves make them play very differently from Pepino. Gus and Brick possess a double jump, and while they can wall run, they can instead wall jump. Gus can also kick Brick forward, allowing Brick to kill any enemies in front of him. Gus alone can perform a spin attack that propels him a short distance forward, and kills any enemies who happen to get hit by him, and can also perform a stomp attack by pressing down in midair. Though this is only really used to kill any enemies below, as it can break metal boxes. Trust me when I say mastering these characters is a really fun experience to go through. It's so satisfying to nail down that movement in certain sections of the two levels you get to play as Gus and Brick. Wait, only two levels? Yeah, spoiler alert, this level and the level in the next floor above, the Pig City, are the only levels where you can play as Gus and Brick. Which is really unfortunate. These two don't get a lot of screen time to shine, and it would have been really cool to see them feature in more levels. Maybe one day we'll get like a floor S or something with more levels that hopefully include these two. The songs in this level are also really cool, with the first song being one of my favorites in the game. Though you don't get to hear it as much due to Peppino's part being cut short and replaced by the song using Gus and Brick's part. Which is also good, don't get me wrong though, and fits the forest theme this level goes for more than the first song. I just wish we got to hear more of the first song in regular gameplay. Ah, what the fuck, man? With all those stages done, we can finally move on to this floor's boss fight. The noise. Yeah. 
Yo, why are he looking at me like that? The noise has had a strange history. He was originally an antagonist, disrupting Peppino's journey by throwing bombs out of windows and the trigger for pizza time before Pillar John was made the trigger for it. A little later in the golf demo, he was made a playable character, albeit in a very early scene having Peppino in a yellow color as a placeholder in some animations. During a later point in development, McPig wanted the noise to have more of a significant role in the game. He went about it by having him be the only playable character in Refrigerator Refrigerator Freezerator, and was even meant to be playable alongside Pepino in single player and co-op. However, at some point between April of 2021 and August of 2022, the noise was made a boss instead of a playable character. With all that being said though, the noise is planned to be a playable character in an update, with his fight being replaced with the Doys should be playing as him. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, back to the boss fight. The boss fight takes place in this large boxing ring in a barren desert, surrounded by cameras broadcasting the fight to the Noises TV broadcasting channel called NTV. The environment is bare bones when you compare it to backgrounds found in normal levels, but when compared to other boss backgrounds, I find it to be one of the more detailed ones in the game. In terms of the fight itself, this is possibly the most 90s cartoon ass fight this game could conjure up. From the over the top attack animations to the fight volley he and Pepino get into, to the end of the fight that screams, I can fix him. Everything about this fight is so silly and goofy, and it's something out of a 90s cartoon, like I mentioned earlier. It perfectly aligns with the noise's childlike giddiness and the game's animation style as a whole, and it plays pretty well. Not to mention the music that sounds like something straight out of a boss in Sonic Mania. In terms of aligning with the artistic and animation style, I think the noise is the perfect character for this game. I could go on and on about how expressive he is with his animations, how the devs did a pretty good job in capturing the personality of the Noid while making him his own thing, you, you get the idea. If you couldn't tell, I like this fight. Is it as good as the Vigilante fight? Nah, but it's still pretty good. Anyways, up we go to the 4th floor. We've reached the 4th floor of this game now, meaning we're over 60% done with the game. Still a bit more to go though. You know, I haven't mentioned this yet, but since we're close to the final floor of the game, I might as well get a word in about it. Hidden in each floor is a secret room that are in somewhat obscure locations. Covered up by breakable blocks, these rooms contain a gag related to the game's lore, and sometimes easter eggs related to the game's development, such as these guys. Camembert Squire, an unused enemy later adapted into the Weenie Mount, and the Cheese Dragon, an unused boss. There's at least one on each floor, so get to exploring I guess. Or just look it up on the wiki. <coughs> The Pig City is one of my favorite levels in the game, mainly because of these guys, but also because of the same reasons you should expect from me by now. Great music that complements the theme and design of the level, good level design in general, and good gameplay overall. The theming of the first half of this level is based off of large urban inner city areas, while the second half is based off of Chinatown, with the general theme of this level being focused on the 1980s, as seen with the design of the level and music. Hell, the first song in this level interpolates Another One Bites to Dust, and the song name is a pun related to the song. One of the main premises of this level revolves around these taxis scattered throughout the level. These contain a relatively short platforming section, with the end housing one of the tall pins for the level. Within these sections contains Hamcup, who I would call the main gimmick of this level, and behaves differently depending on who you're playing. With Pepino, he will tether these sausages to him that stop him from going any further until Hamcup is killed. With Gus and Brick on the other hand, he will remove Brick from the player, requiring them to play as Gus alone until Hamcup is killed yet again. You know, this path seems eerily similar to something I've seen before. Nah. Speeding through this level is just so much fun, and it's one of the reasons I like this level so much. Blitzing past all these enemies, grunting on these rails like it's Sonic Rush, even the slower paced Gus and Brick sections can be ran through in just about a minute. Gameplay wise, this level speaks to what makes Pizza Tower so enjoyable for me. I really like this level if you couldn't tell already. On the other hand, however... This level's I. 
I don't have anything major against it, but at the same time, if you were to put this level in your bottom 10, I wouldn't blame you. The theme and design of this level is nice, taking clear inspiration from TMNT, which is a no-brainer if you ask me. Sewer Turtles That Eat Pizza, a pizza-themed game with a level set in a sewer? Come on now, man! And this is clearly reflected in the song for the level, which is reminiscent of the beat-em-up game TMNT Turtles in Time, and the SNES soundtrack specifically. In the beginning, I didn't really care that much for the music, but over time I've kind of warmed up to it and it's not one of my favorite tracks in the game. The gameplay's fine, nothing bad, but nothing extraordinary either. My only gripe with this level is that sometimes it can feel pretty slow, especially with the trash pan sections since you move really slowly with them. Apart from that, I've not really got much else to say about this level. Insane stuff going on here. Now I know what you're gonna say. Oh, an ice level. It's gotta be some hot garbage, right? And this may be difficult to stomach, but this ice level is actually pretty good. At least when compared to other ice levels I've played. I actually don't think this level is that amazing. And while I don't have a visceral hatred for it, compared to the other levels in this game, I do think there are better levels in this. That being said, like the past two levels, if there's one definite compliment I can give, it's the theming and how the team did a great job on incorporating that winter slash Christmas-esque theme into the design and music of the level. To the evil Santa that stalks you throughout the level, to the detailed backgrounds that are supposed to be even more detailed and filled with some pop culture references, to that joyous theme that plays in the first section of the level, it does a good job in capturing that early December-ish feeling. Good level. Nothing more, nothing less. Ow! For the final level of this floor, we have Pepebot Factory, which, I'll be honest, wasn't really that memorable. The songs featured in the level are pretty good, with the song in the first half of the level being one of my favorites. The way the level plays is fine, and I have no problem with any of the gimmicks or transformation featured within the level. The design of the level is solid and detailed, so what's the problem? It's just kinda... eh. It's good, don't get me wrong, I'm not dismissing the level's quality in any regard, but to me, it's just kinda there. I don't really have much else to say about it. Good level, but in my opinion, a bit forgettable. Anyways, you know the deal by now, let's move on. Yo, who the fuck is this man right here? Fake Pepino is the fourth boss in this game, and is definitely an odd guy to say the least. He's not your typical fake character like Fake Crash or... Uh, fake Crash? While he does bear a striking resemblance to Pepino, his actions and mannerisms completely distinguish him from Pepino in any regard. I mean, just look at him. He's all stuttery, and he's got this damn eye hanging out from his socket, and... Oh, uh, uh, okay. At the very least, he's dedicated to the bit, as his clothing changes to match your own, so I guess there's that? Enough of that though, I'm more in the fight itself. The main gimmick of this fight revolves around Fake Pepino and his clones. Fake Pepino will perform 6 attacks through 6 hit points. After getting hit once, Fake Pepino will disappear and his clones will attack the player based on the last attack. Shortly after, the real Fake Pepino will reappear, where the player can attack him. After losing 1 hit point, Fake Pepino will go to the next attack and cycle through them until he loses all of his health. In which phase 2 begins, where the clones no longer disappear during the real Fake Pepino's attacks, and will no longer execute the same attack as his attacks in order to throw the player off. Once the player delivers the final hit on Fake Pepino, the... 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 the oh, what?! Uh, 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 God damn! Ah! That was an experience. I think we've seen enough from this floor, let's just get to the final one. We now arrive at the final floor, staff only as it's referred to in game, the home stretch. Staff only contains three of what I consider the best pizza tower levels this game has to offer. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything any longer, i just head straight into it. Now this is how you remix a level. So, short history lesson. 
Originally, this level was simply a harder version of Peace Escape with a Halloween theme, and was specifically made for the Halloween 2019 build of the game titled Noises Hard Halloween, where the noise was the only playable character. Between then and the rework build dated September of 2021, this level was given a massive overhaul, keeping the core idea while still expanding on it quite a bit and making Pepino a playable character. After some more polish, we now have the final version of Pizza Scare. This level is more of a Halloween-fied and difficult version of Pizza Escape, with new gimmicks, enemies, and an entirely different level layout when compared to the Halloween build of the game, with the main gimmick being this guy, the Ghost King. The player he brings to this level is really cool, and one that I enjoy very much. So essentially, Ghost King will possess certain objects within the level in an attempt to harm the player, though in doing so will also help progress the player forward. One of the objects he can possess is his TV, which he can't escape from without assistance from the player. I really like this dynamic of helping the player progress further, while also making an effort to stunt their progress. Not much else to say about it, it's all the mechanic. The other new mechanic that I quickly like to mention involves these two guys, Ghost Knights and Exorcists. Ghost Knights are similar to Fork Knights in terms of behavior, but with one caveat. Instead of simply running into them to kill them, Pepino will instead pass right through them, with the only way of killing them being the use of a Super Taunt, or with the help of the Exorcist. Touching an Exorcist will make Pepino temporarily invincible, giving him the ability to kill Ghost Knights. If I haven't made it obvious, this is one of my favorite levels, not only because of the gameplay, but also because of the... get ready for this one. The music. I'm not gonna harp in it too long, and you can listen to the song yourself on YouTube, but just know, it's pretty damn good. Essentially, great level, nothing more, nothing less. I'm just gonna get straight to the point. I really like this level, but not solely because of the gameplay or anything like that, but because of the atmosphere this level's music, design, and gimmick creates. To further emphasize my point, let me set the stage for you. It's late at night, you're blasting through the last few stages in Pizza Tower to get the game finished. You enter into the doorway for this level, not knowing what to expect, but still go through the same game plan that you always have, running straight into the potential danger. You make it to the third room, no issues so far, until you come across an immovable object. You stand next to it, seeing this little guy with a timer countdown. What could possibly- OH JESUS CHRIST! The atmosphere this level creates is really good. Up until this point, you've played these colorful, vibrant levels with an air of silliness to them. This level absolutely messes with the previous experiences you've had, putting you in an environment and atmosphere never seen in the game before so far. The music makes you feel uneasy while still keeping that pizza tower charm that's customary to the game's soundtrack, using a slow tempo alongside the piano, some synths, and a variety of sound effects, subtle and noticeable to keep that feeling of unease within the player, to build that tension throughout the level. I don't know, maybe I'm slightly overthinking it. The level's main gimmick involves these enemies called patrollers and these animatronics. The grounded patrollers pace back and forth with a searchlight, looking for the player while the flying patroller stays in one spot. Should the player be spotted by the patrollers, they will have 5 seconds to kill the patroller or leave the room, making this a kind of stealth level. That being said though, not all patrollers can be killed, and some of them need to be activated in order to make progress throughout the level. 5 seconds after being spotted, the patroller will activate the alarm and will activate the Toppin Monster animatronic. The Toppin Monster will chase the player around the room. If the player gets caught by the Toppin Monster, the player will get jump scared and will be reset to the start of the room, as if the player fell off the stage. All Toppin Monsters can be defeated with your default kit and must be killed via the shotgun or in certain cases, baiting them to fall down a hole covered by outlet blocks. While being chased by the Toppin Monsters, this tense music plays in the background adding to that fear factor, anxiously checking to see if the top of monster is close to you. Uh, piss off, piss off, please god almighty, ah! To summarize, this level excels at what it sets out to do, not only by creating this tense atmosphere, but by also incorporating elements of that atmosphere into how the level is played as a whole. That being said though, the level doesn't require multiple games and multiple hour long YouTube videos to understand its lore, and doesn't have me over analyzing blank squares. So 7.4 out of 10, not enough convoluted lore. Does it surprise you in any way to hear that this level is my favorite and is what I consider the best level in this game? Shit, I hope not. Take every level in this game, cut out all the fat and flubber from each level, get rid of the whole thing, and replace it with a late game Risk of Rain 2 run. Okay, it's not that crazy, so I'd say mid game.
But yeah, that's basically war in a nutshell. Everything from the music, the atmosphere and environment, the gameplay, everything in this level feels like it was made for me and about 10 billion other people. The sheer chaotic feel this level creates, making you feel that pressure, knowing that this is the final stretch to facing the final boss, I love it. The level's main gimmick revolves around these computer terminals. After picking up the shotgun, a timer unlike the previous one shows up, with 30 seconds on the clock. This timer can be increased by destroying these terminals, which then adds 30 seconds to the clock. Because of this, this is the only level within the entire game with Pillage on absence. Should the timer reach zero, Pizza Face will not show up, and instead, the level will immediately end. This level is also unique in how each secret is open and in plain sight, with the same quirk being shared with the Jerome location, adding to that quick, fast-paced gameplay style this level has. The level design also captures that feeling of war pretty well, transitioning from the inside of a bunker, to the war zone ahead, to a futuristic lab of sorts? Not what I have in my mind when I think of war, but I. We also get to see a bit of lore, where we can see Pepino clones and Pillajon in cloning vats, implying that the Pillajons seen throughout the game are actually clones, and the Pepino clones seen within the level are made here. This is all according to YouTube comments, which are known to be part of the highest echelons of society, alongside the likes of Blackrock and Kevin MacLeod. I don't really have much else to say, and really, what else needs to be said? This is my favorite level in the game, and that's that. With all the necessary tokens in hand, we can finally move on to the final frontier of this game. Well, after all this time, all this waiting, you're finally here. It took you so long to get here. Not gonna lie, it would have been really funny if it made you start from the beginning of the game for jumping off the cliffside, but I guess that's why I'm not a game developer. Here we are, face to face with the final boss, and he means business. Just look at how intense this fight is already. <coughs> okay, I promise it gets a lot better. Pizza Face's attack pattern is pretty simple. He'll split an enemy down, then he charges at the player where the player can use the enemy spat down to damage him. After each hit though, the enemy variety and amount spawned in increases, with a total of 6 enemies being spawned in at once when this health is at the lowest. After landing the final hit, he floats in the middle of the stage, and- HOLY FISH PASTE! IT'S A GUY! Yeah, the whole time, Pizza Face was a mech being piloted by this guy. Entering into the second phase of the fight, we get introduced to the true antagonist and final boss of the game, Pizza Head. If I were to describe him in a single sentence, it would be 1930s maniacal villain. The wiki describes him as not appearing to take anything seriously, and cheerful, unhinged, and comically villainous, which is very accurate as what you're about to see with these attacks. Before the second phase begins, however, Pizza Head hands Pepino a pistol to use a la the vigilante fight, just to keep things fair, I guess. Anyways, when it comes to attacks, Pizza Head can throw a huge TV that has Pepino on the screen that then proceeds to bounce around, throw a cluster of 5 dynamite sticks in random locations, bring out a small Uzi that he will then fire until it runs out of ammo, in which he will then throw said Uzi towards the player, pull up a part of the goddamn ground, oh, shit. launching a bunch of fork knights from the ground, who will then die and drop the forks, which will also be launched up, throw a stupid rat towards the player, which will then bounce on the ground, and pull up a picture of Well, to add on to this, after Pizza Head loses 3 hit points, Pizza Face comes back and spits out these cogs that slide across the stage and damage the player if contact is made, which can create with some really awkward scenarios where taking damage is an inevitability. After whittling down his health, the fight's finally over. Is what I would say if we lived in a blissful world. Pizza Head gets up like the last phase never happened, and decides to bring in their previous 4 bosses, cause why not? Pepino then goes scaring off all the other bosses except for Pepperman before charging straight into them. The player must now go through a sort of boss rush, where one attack from Pepino takes away 4 HP from each boss, and attacks are reused from their respective fights. 
Apart from that, the only real difference comes from the vigilante part of the fight, where instead of getting another pistol, you instead use Gustavo's ammunition. After that part of the fight ends, you can still use Gustavo, but he's not really needed anymore. Slowly but surely, you clear through the remaining bosses and get to the real phase 3 of the fight, where Pizza Head comes back and tries to finish off Pepino for the last time with a deadly attack arsenal of a fly swatter, boxing gloves, a somersault, and the expansion jutsu from Naruto. After depleting all of his health on three separate occasions, Pepino air combos the ever living shit out of Pizza Head before proceeding to power drive his head straight into the tower. One last pillar, let's get the hell out of here. Here we have it. One last climb down. Who's here? Fucking everyone. What's here? Fucking everything. In this level, Pepino makes one last dash for the exit, where he collects every relevant character in this game on his way out. The level throws everything the player has come across in their time playing this game for one last time. Every enemy you can think of is present in this level. While there's not as many gimmicks or mechanics in this level, they do utilize some of the ones that are more prevalent throughout the game. Ah! Working your way down, you collect more characters before making it to the bottom of the tower. Another fun fact, this part of the level was actually changed after release. At the end here, there used to be more platforms and some fork knights, but was changed in the patch to have dash panels instead. This is the only level in the game to be changed post-launch, with the only other instance of this happening being in the fake Pepino chase sequence. Eventually, you make your way back to the entrance of the tower and... The tower crumbles, with everyone evacuated. Your journey is finally over. Afterwards, you're presented with the end credits, alongside a few neat pictures of the cast in unusual scenarios. Should you wait through the credits, or skip them, you're then presented with the last post credit section, Pepino's Final Judgment. The game will present you with the percentage of completion acquired throughout your time playing the game, alongside an image of Pepino and his reaction to your percentage. The image of Pepino is influenced by your percentage of completion, and in some cases, how fast you finish the game. The images can range from Pepino simply telling you that you suck, to complete all. Should you want to update your judgment, you simply go back and be Pizza Head and the Crumbling Tower of Pizza where you will then be given an updated judgment screen. After returning to the file select screen, you're also shown some extra things, such as the pizza boy whose facial expression changes depending on the completion percentage, and some other things should the player fulfill the requirements needed. Alright, game's done. Now what? Well, job's not finished. After I finished the game for the first time, I decided I wanted to do at least do two things before I wrap it up for good. The first one being one of the main reasons I made this video in the first place. I don't consider myself a completionist in any regard. The most I've done in terms of 100%ing a game in the past 5 years is getting every achievement in Sonic Frontiers and finishing the game on the hard one for the TRUE final boss, and getting nearly every achievement in Geometry Dash except for one, and that's because I can't create a good level to save my goddamn life. Either that or people can't appreciate real artistic expression. Whenever I pick up a game, I usually just play through it, go for a few collectibles, finish it, and lock it away, never to be seen again. However, after I finished Pizza Tower, I was left wanting more from the game. I was hungry, and eventually I found out how to satisfy that hunger. I noticed that I had completed a small amount of chef tasks, had found a decent but not all of the tower secret treasures, and still had quite a few secret eyes to find. At that moment, I told myself that I was going to do everything this game had to offer. That included getting every secret eye, getting every secret treasure, getting every chef task, and every P rank. I was going to 100% the game. I'll go over getting the collectibles and achievements, or chef tasks first. As previously mentioned, the collectibles consist of three things. The toppins, the secret eyes, and the tower secret treasures. All of which are scattered throughout each level. You can keep track of what collectibles you've gotten throughout each level by standing outside the level doorway, checking with the pizza granny sign on each floor, or checking where you're at globally with the computer. 
After collecting every Toppin and having it converted to money, you'll be left with $90 since only 85 Toppins are needed to finish the game. With the rest of the money, you can give it to this poor old familiar looking man near the doorway to war in exchange for an orange costume. For finding every secret eye, you can find a secret eye in each floor, which takes you to a sound test room containing Gustavo and the Secret King, where you can listen to every song in the game, plus a few extras. While playing a song, Peppino, Gustavo, and the Secret King will dance along to the song. While I do think this is a neat inclusion, what's the whole point of this when the whole soundtrack's gonna be on YouTube, Spotify, etc? I think something more fitting as a prize for finding each secret eye could be a gauntlet of secret rooms where you could challenge yourself to see how quickly you can clear all of them. Even if it's not much, it still adds some kind of replayability. Finally, we have the Tower Secret Treasures, and these affect the ending of the game. After collecting every single one, after you finish the Pizza Face fight and the Crumbling Tower of Pizza, you get to see the true version of the cutscene where Pizza Head gets back up. In this instance, all of the treasures collected fly out of Pepino and are absorbed by Pillar John. But not just any Pillar John the original Pillar John, and are used to revive him. In his revived state, in a single strike, John will punch Pizza Head into the stratosphere, Team Rocket style. After S-ranking every level, and with all of these combined, going back and defeating Pizza Face and clearing the crumbling tower of pizza, and sitting or skipping the end credits, will present the player with a new judgement. After going back to the file select screen, you'll be able to see your completion percentage, which should be at 100%. That's it, right? 100%, no more game left to be played. Eh, not quite. There's still more, and that's where chef tasks come into play. I've already gone over them, but to go into a bit more depth, to each floor there are a total of 18 chef tasks, except for floor 5 when there is only 15, since the crumbling tower of pizza doesn't have any chef tasks. Each level has 3 chef tasks, you know what, fuck it, I'm just gonna call them achievements. And each boss has an achievement for beating it without taking any damage, while there is also an extra achievement for S-ranking each level on a floor. Some of these achievements are pretty easy and can be achieved accidentally, and some of them require a bit more thoughtful planning and reading comprehension. Overall though, I found these achievements to be pretty straightforward, so I don't have much to comment on here. Now, you may have noticed that 67 isn't quite equal to 72, and that's because there are 5 hidden achievements. To unlock them, you need to P-rank every level on a given floor. Whew, I've been waiting a while to talk about this, and I'm very glad I can do that now. At the beginning of the video, I alluded to the P-rank, but never bothered to explain what it was in full, and shifted it off to the side. So, here's the explanation. The P rank is a type of rank similar to the S rank, first mentioned by Pizza Granny in floor 5 when she spawns next to the computer. Where for the S rank, all you need are a bunch of points, P ranks require you to get all 3 secrets, the Tower Secret Treasure, complete a lap 2 of the run, reach the score requirement for an S rank, and most critical of all, do all of that while keeping your combo, which has to begin in the first room throughout the entirety of the level from start to finish. Sounds difficult, right? And that's because it is! Getting each level's P rank requires careful planning, memorization of the level layout front to back, and a near good understanding of the game's mechanics and gimmicks within the levels. This type of challenge is exactly like in 2D platformers, requiring the player to properly understand how to go through the level. P ranking levels took a surprising amount of planning to properly pull off, such as planning out what enemies to kill in what order to make sure I have a source of points to keep the combo running, if I should save collectibles for lap 2, etc. And while you could trial and error your way through some of these, I found it more enjoyable to figure out what needs to be done in order to get that P rank. Your reward for P ranking a level is this sick new ranking screen, and for P ranking every level on the floor, you get a hidden achievement. P ranking also made me rethink how I thought of levels from a reviewing standpoint. Some levels that I thought were kinda boring became more enjoyable as soon as I started going for that P rank, while others degraded in quality. No two levels epitomize this more for me than Ancient Cheese and Oh Shit. My thoughts on Ancient Cheese initially were that while the level is cool and all, it wasn't really that memorable. When I went for the P rank, my opinion on the level shifted drastically as I got to see more of what the level had to offer, and I now consider it a, at the very least, top 10 level. Oh Shit on the other hand. After P ranking the level, I never willingly played the level again until making this video and getting footage. And the reasoning stems from this stupid fucker right here. 
See him? I hate him. Sometimes whenever I get pinched by him, my momentum will just stop completely, thus ending my P-Rank attempt. And while I'm aware that this is just a massive skill issue, I can't help but at least mention my raw contempt for this bastard. And don't get me started on these assholes, god I hate them so fucking much. If it wasn't obvious, I don't really conjure up the kindest of feelings for these two whenever I think about them. Because of them, I have oh shit in my bottom half of pizza tower levels. I don't necessarily hate the level, just those two elements. I should also mention that the P ranking criteria is different for bosses. Because there's no way to earn points in bosses, ranks are instead given on how many hits you took during the fight. D for 9 or more, C for 7 to 8, B for 5 to 6, A for 3 to 4, S for 1 to 2, and P for taking no hits during the fight. Not only do you knife yourself that P rank, but you also get an achievement for taking no hits during the fight, which is pretty cool. With that being said though, this can quickly get grindy. Which is why during my first playthrough, I acquired a P ranks throughout a multiple day stretch, just so I didn't get burnt out. And this worked, and I managed to get all the P ranks for every stage and boss. Well, except for one. You see this motherfucker right here? This thing damn near had me at odds with my own psyche. If you're wondering why I don't have footage of me P-ranking this boss, it's because I simply don't want to P-rank this boss fight ever again. I did it once during my first playthrough and decided right at that moment to never go for it again. While this can be characterized as me overreacting, which I'll admit is kinda true, and a skill issue, which again is kinda true, I figured it'd be best if I simply showed you what's up with this fight. Phase 1 starts off simple enough, predictable attack pattern of spit down enemy, then rush in, but as his health gets lower, he spawns in more enemies at a time, and the enemy variety he spawns in also increases. Out of the enemy list, two of the enemies have proven to be the bane of my existence. Ninja Slice and Spit Cheese. Spit Cheese seems to perfectly calculate down to the very coordinate and time his cheese spike to hit me on the exact nanosecond, and usually hits me whenever I'm paying attention to something more worthwhile than it. Ninja Slice is annoying for much the same reason. It strikes me usually when I'm trying to pay attention to something else. Oh, but it gets worse. After phase 1, Pizza Head comes out to finish the job, and while this phase on its own isn't that bad and mistakes were made due to poor movement from myself, the real issue comes after taking away three of his hit points. Pizza Face comes back, Mamba Mentality and all, to finish the job, and starts to spit down these cogs, which can create for some really awkward situations, essentially guaranteeing a dead run. The start of Phase 3 is relatively simple to get around, and so is the latter part of Phase 3. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, but try repeating the first two phases and sometimes the third phase only to get hit by the stupidest of shit and restart the whole fight from the beginning for almost an hour. If you don't go insane by the half hour mark then you just have impenetrable mental, I don't know what to tell you except well done, proud of you. Now I'll admit that when I was going for the P rank I had like significant amounts of knowledge that at the time probably could have given me an easier time in the fight. That and I also never bothered to invest much time into learning the attack patterns of the fight. So you could say that most of the problems I had P rank in this fight lie squarely on me, and if I went ahead and done it again, I could get it done relatively quickly. And while you're probably right about that, it's just way easier to simply complain about it on the internet. Oh my god! Beyond ridiculous! Your eternal reward for getting every single achievement and P rank you ask? One extra percent. And a golden pillar John sticker on the file select screen. And it was all completely worth it. Overall though, going for the P ranks in this levels and grinding the achievements were probably the most fun I've had with the game. And despite those hiccups here and there, I highly recommend at least attempting P ranks for your favorite levels. Who knows, you may even go for the rest of them if you enjoy it that much. Speedrunning. It's cool. I'm not gonna go over what speedrunning is in depth since A, I really can't be bothered to, and B, most of you probably already know what it is thanks to Summoning Salt and Green Man. But in case you aren't aware of it, I'll let you skim through this Wikipedia article. Okay, done, let's move on. Truly exciting stuff. 
Throughout this video, you may have noticed a small timer in the bottom right hand corner of my screen at some point, and that's because in game settings, there's an option to toggle on a timer for speedrunning. Back during Pizza Tower's development, a small speedrunning community formed around speedrunning the publicly available builds of the game, such as the Sage 2019 build, the Strong Cold build, and the Hardoween build. While I have no idea what happened between then and the final build of the game, I assume Mick Pig or someone on the dev team took notice and added the timer to make timing for speedrunning easier and forego the use of external tools such as live split, which is great. The only real problem it has is that the timer stops whenever the game is paused, opening it up to exploitation, which is why I think times on the leaderboards are tracked in real time instead of in game time. With that out of the way, there are two main types of speedruns that you can do for Pizza Tower full game speedruns or individual level speedruns, or ILs for short. Both of these are pretty self-explanatory. Full game covers the entire game from start to finish, while ILs only cover one specific level. For Pizza Tower, there are four different categories of full game runs. Any% percent, which is being the game as fast as possible using whatever methods are allowed. True Ending, which is collecting all of the tower secret treasures. 100% which is collecting all the treasures, plus getting an S rank on every level and collecting every top in secret, and 101%, which consists of all of that, but instead of getting an S rank, you need to get a P rank. Now, while I could have tried my hand at speedrunning the whole game, I'm simply too lazy to put in that time investment into learning the whole game. And also because I'm a massive, uh, that, or this, I don't know, take a pick. So instead, I tried my hand at IL speedruns. When it came to deciding which levels I wanted to run, I picked the ones whose gameplay appealed to me the most, whose level design would bring out the most thoughtful I picked my favorites. And that one too, I guess. Now, to keep it brief, I only managed to finish one IL speedrun before making this video. That being a fast food saloon in 2 minutes, 28 seconds, and 890 milliseconds, which puts me at 9th on the leaderboard as of me writing this. You can find it on the speedrun.com page of Pizza Tower, or by going to my second channel and doing it there. I also might as well add to this by saying that the game's speedrunning community is pretty active, and the game was even at SGDQ this year, with runner Soaring Sloth doing the run of his couch of Ellie Jelly, Shay, and Wolfly D commentating the run. Stun mocking him 24-7, uh, so... Yep. Just one attack right here is uh, kinda hard. Yeah, alright, enough of that. Honestly, if you have the time and have nothing better to do once you've completed this game, give speedrunning a go. You'll enjoy it. For a little bit, probably. Before I move on and wrap this video up, fucking finally, I wanted to rank every Pizza Tower level and boss, rating them on a scale through 1 to 10. Oh, and for you kids sitting on your phone right now, scrolling through Instagram Reels or whatever short form video platform is going to make your attention span melt the quickest, I've included a tier list at the end just so you can easily digest it and go back to watching Minecraft vs Roblox rap battles featuring Friday Night Funkin' characters or some, something like that. Oh, and here's that tier list I promised. And some Subway Surfers gameplay. Alright, I got my YouTube analytics up now. We're good now. That oughta do it. This game is great. Amazing, even. Yeah, thanks for that. I've played a good amount of games in my lifetime so far, with a decent chunk of those being 2D platformers, and I can confidently say that this game easily ranks one of my top 10 favorite platformers. There is so much care and attention that has been put into this game, and it shows. Sure there are a few hiccups here and there, but overall this game does what it sets out to do in the first place. Take the Wario Land formula, make it fit into a more modern environment, while making sure it's still its own thing. Like I said, there are flaws within the game, don't get me wrong, but the things it gets right nearly more than makes up for it. 
nearly. Now this is the part where I tell you to go get the game since it's on sale right now, but uh, making videos at a consistent rate is hard. So go buy it when it goes on sale next time or something. All in all, a good game, but not as good as Imagine Party Babies, the uh, 7 out of 10. What? I'm tired. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's a black show. What, I can't be tired at 1 in the morning? God damn, am I finally happy to get this done. Um, I spent half a year on this video alone and I'd say 75% of it was just scripting it. Um, as much fun as I had replaying Pizza Tower, making this video was a long, long, long endeavor, which you can see by the runtime. Um, so going forward, I don't think I'll do long form content like this. I just don't think it's worth it. You know, half a year for this is like, it's like nice and all, but I think it's better to just get like short 15, 20 minute videos, something that can take me at least like a month, two months maybe. Uh, I, I just think it's like a lot more worthwhile. But um, yeah, that being said, I if you made it this far, you know, thanks, all that good stuff that people always say. Um, there's a channel icon here, and then like two more videos, uh, do whatever you want with them. See ya.